Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's great to be back with you here this morning. I've had a few weeks off, like six, uh, from, from preaching. Not, I haven't have been totally off, so just, just from preaching, we have had some vacation in there. And I just want to thank Maddie and our overseers and you guys for allowing me and my family this opportunity, this much needed, much needed break from the normal routine just to kind of uh, get a breather. Um, I realized that as I was taking this break that for, for nine years, I've not had more than two Sundays off at a time, which, you know, a lot of you are probably like, well, that's not a big deal. I've never had more than two Sundays off either or two weeks off either, but it gets to be a grind. You know, I have to come up with new material all the time, all the time. So, so it, it benefits me and it benefits the church to take that time off, but I, it's just such a privilege to, to have people that care for us, care for our church. And most importantly, I think, care for our next generation of leaders. Speaking of which, how about Maddie these past six weeks, huh? What, what a pure joy it has been to watch these last six weeks as he's really come into his own and really found his, his rhythm and found his voice and had that calling that God's placed in his heart that we all know and it's being, being confirmed right before our eyes. And so he just hit it out of the park each and every week and I'm, I'm just so happy and, and so proud of him and, and of our church. And so I think it's just a great and healthy thing for our church. And honestly, I feel a certain degree of pressure to bring it this morning. Because I've been gone for a while, and he did such a great job, and now I feel like I really have to bring my A game today, so I don't know, we'll see, we'll see what happens today. But it's just all a little bit weird, because like, uh, there are people that have been coming here for the last few weeks that I haven't even met yet. Uh, Caleb over here, he's been drumming for the last three weeks, and we just met this morning. I'm like... This is so awesome, though. It's so cool to be part of a church where you leave for a week. I think it's awesome anyway. And then new people come, and things change, and, and things are never the same. And many of you know that. If you're gone for more than two weeks, you come back, and something is going to have changed. And you're going to be like, what? Why did they do that? But I think, it's, I think it's awesome. I think it's a good sign of a healthy, growing church. Well, today we are picking up this unstoppable series that we're doing. We're picking it up in Acts chapter 16. And the book of Acts in the New Testament of the Bible tells the story of Christ's unstoppable church and how it grew from this one man, Jesus Christ, to become this global, worldwide, unstoppable force. And at the very beginning in Acts chapter 1, which we looked at way back last summer, if you weren't here, you can go back and you can find that from last summer on our website, epiphanystation.com, and, and get the whole story. But back then, even, Jesus talked about, he, he talked about, he gathered his disciples together, and, and he said, look, this is going to start small, right here with you 12, here in Jerusalem, but it's not going to stay small. It's going to start small and local, but it is going to explode into something huge and global in just a matter of years. And so as you read the book of Acts, you see this unfolding before our eyes as each week as we've been going through this, the church grows. It reaches a little bit wider and it grows a little bit larger and in some cases a lot a bit larger as it grows in thousands of people literally overnight. And so last week, Maddie talked about how do you handle this issue of church growth? And so the leaders got together in Jerusalem. They talked about how do, we, how do we welcome in all of these outsiders who are not like us but are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. How do we welcome them in while, while still holding true to the teachings of Jesus? And so their conclusion in Acts chapter 15 was essentially this. It was, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Let's not get caught off on the left or the right with, with all these man-made traditions and these rules and these regulations and our personal preferences. Let's stay focused on Jesus. Let's make the main thing the main thing. And so that's exactly what they do. And this turns out to be a Holy Spirit-inspired decision that enables the church to continue to reach wider and to grow deeper and increase in numbers and effectiveness and influence. And as we pick up the story today, we'll discover that there's another critical decision 
that is made that allows this good news of Jesus Christ to continue to spread around the globe. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 16, and I am just going to give you a brief overview of the first half of the chapter before we get into it. But I want to start back at the end of chapter 15, which Maddie didn't get to this part last week. But at the end of chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas are kind of like the, they're the first official commissioned Christian missionaries. And so they, they go on this missionary tour where they're spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and in church history now, and, you know, if you look in the back of your Bible or something at the maps, that will be known as Paul's first missionary journey. Some reason Barnabas totally gets slighted, even though he was there too. But, but it's Paul's first missionary journey. And so at the conclusion of that, they report their findings back to the leaders in Jerusalem, which we have in chapter 15. But then after that, Paul and Barnabas have a sharp disagreement. And it is so sharp that they decide to part ways. And Barnabas goes one way, and he takes with him John Mark, who is the author of the Gospel of Mark in the Bible. And Paul decides to go another way, and he takes with him Silas as a traveling companion. And then Luke, who has written the book of Acts and also the Gospel of Luke, the biography of Jesus by the same name, he, he goes with Paul and Silas. And so at this point, we don't hear much more about Barnabas at that point. So this is where we get to Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas travel. We're going to get a map up here because this will really be helpful when we get to this point. So Paul and Silas travel from Jerusalem, which is down here in the bottom right, and they travel here to Derbe, and then to Lystra there. And in, in Lystra, they pick up Timothy, who is a young man, probably about the age of 16, 17, young in age, but very strong in the faith, very respected among the other Christians in the area. And this Timothy becomes Paul's protege, his understudy. And in later writings, we'll find out that he probably even becomes one of Paul's very best friends. And later, Timothy would become pastor of the church in Ephesus, which is right here. And Paul would write a couple letters to him called First and Second Timothy that we have in the New Testament of our Bible. But these three men, Paul and Silas and Timothy, then, they then travel all around this region here sharing with the churches that are already established there about the ruling in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, about keeping the main thing the main thing. And the result then, it says in verse 5 of chapter 16, is this. So the churches were strengthened in their faith, and they grew larger every day. Then something strange happens. Something very strange and history-changing happens. Paul and Silas attempt to go up to, over to Asia, which is this region right here. But it says that the Holy Spirit prevented them from going there. So then they attempt to go up to here, Bithynia, and it says the Holy Spirit prevented them from going there as well. This is very strange. We're not given any details about what that looks like, how they, they knew that those doors were shut. It just continues on and says that they then, so they couldn't go there, they couldn't go there, so they went there to Mysia, and they ended up in the city of Troas, they are the port city of Troas. And this is where the game changer happens. While they're there in Troas, Paul has a vision or a dream of a man in Macedonia, which is this region over here, across the Aegean Sea. This is a place where the good news of Jesus Christ has not yet been to. And in this vision, this man says, come over here. Come over here and help us. We need you. And so now here's the game changer. In verse 10, it says, So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. This divine invite and this simple act of obedience, of going at once, brings the good news to Europe for the very first time. Something that I think most of this room directly benefit from if we're from European descent. This is the first time that the good news of Jesus Christ goes to Europe. And once there, they travel on to the city of Philippi, which is right there. And Philippi was a Roman colony. Now, Rome was a big empire. Roman Empire was big. 
And there was no internet then for them to stay connected. So what they did is they had kind of Roman outposts all throughout the Roman Empire, kind of a Rome away from Rome. And Philippi was one of those Roman colonies. And what they would do is they would give Roman citizens tax incentives to go to live in one of these outposts like Philippi to be a Roman presence there to make sure that the Roman ways, the Roman laws, the Roman customs were adhered to by the locals of that region. And so that's what Philippi was. And there wasn't much of a Jewish population there. Uh, it was Paul's custom to go to a synagogue when he got to Philippi, but instead there was no synagogue. So he went then to a place by the river, it says, where people gathered to pray. And while there, he, sh- he met a woman named Lydia, who it says is a worshiper of God, which means that she wasn't a Jew, but she was someone who believed in the one true God, but she wasn't a Jew and she wasn't a Christian. She didn't have the full revelation of God. So Paul sits down with her by the river and he shares how Jesus Christ completes God's story of love and redemption. And Lydia then puts her faith in Jesus Christ and becomes the first European convert. And that's where we're going to end today here in verse 15 of chapter 16. It goes on for a ways, but that's all we have time to talk about because we're going to, I want to talk about five characteristics of a church on call from what we just went through. Now, talking about a church on call, there's this vision of this, this man in Macedonia saying, come over here. He's, he's calling them over. And how do they respond? Do we have anybody here that's on call for your job ever or today? You know, what, what happens when you're on call? You have to have like your cell phone on or your pager. Do they have pagers anymore? On all the time. And what is the, what is the expectation if you get called or paged You have to go at once, right? It's an emergency. You're needed. And what will happen if you don't go at once? Besides, you might lose your job. Then maybe this emergency will happen without you, and you won't be able to to help in this case. So all these things go into this being a church on call. And we see in this passage, I think, five characteristics of a church on call. Now, if you have a program there, there's an outline there. You can take notes if you'd like to follow along with what I'm going to be talking about. But the first characteristic of a church on call is a church on call will do whatever it takes. Church on call will do whatever it takes to reach people. Verse 2 and 3 of Acts chapter 16. Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium, so Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. In deference to the Jews of the area, he arranged for Timothy to be circumcised before they left, for everyone knew that his father was a Greek. Now, I have three boys, and all three of my boys have been circumcised. It was back in the days when insurance still covered it. Now, with my first two boys, I went down there with them and... and held their hand as they snipped, and and I watched them wail, and I went, mmm, cringe, as they they did the snipping there. With my third son, I was like, I can't do it. Just just take him away. I was like, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to feel guilty about that. Now, I'm pretty sure that my sons, if they had the choice today, they would choose not to be circumcised. If we said, hey, You know what? We missed this when you were born, so we're going to do it now. I don't think they would sign up for that. But here's Timothy, like 16 or 17 years old, and Paul's like, hey, Timothy, I got this great idea. And Timothy's like, "Uh uh-uh, and you aren't going down there. No way. But he does, because Timothy is willing to do whatever it takes to reach people, even allow his precious to get snipped, I guess. Here's here's what we're getting at here. The Apostle Paul says later in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, even though I am a free man with no master, I become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so that I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. 
When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything that I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. A wise Christian knows how to interpret the culture and the spiritual climate and how to know when it's time to to stand firm on the truth and not move. And when there's a time that you can can flex with the culture but still hold on to the truth. And this takes a lot of spiritual discernment and it is not easy because if it were easy, we wouldn't have so many church fighting and church splits and church deaths. So many of those things go down to how do we interpret the culture and how does our doctrine, our faith, our beliefs, and the culture, where do, they, where do they match and where do they separate? What do we need to hold on to and what can we let go of? But one of the problems I see today with churches is that there's a lot of people doing whatever they want for themselves instead of doing whatever it takes to reach someone else doing whatever they want for themselves instead of doing whatever it takes to reach someone else. And a church on call will do whatever it takes to reach people. Second characteristic of a church on call is that a church on call will go wherever God leads. Go wherever God leads. Verse 6. Next, Paul and Silas travel through the area of Phygria and Galatia. If you don't know how to pronounce these areas, don't worry about it. I don't either. I'm just making it up. So it's no big deal. Because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over here to Macedonia and help us. Now imagine with me for a moment, how discouraging must this have been for Paul? Everything was going great. The church was growing and expanding rapidly. All he wanted to do was continue to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, continue to share this good news with people. But it seemed like everywhere he went, the door got slammed shut in his face got slammed shut in his face. We don't know how exactly it got shut. And it doesn't seem like Paul probably even understands why. But Paul and Silas were able to correctly discern that this was God shutting the door and they shouldn't plow through the door. But they need to trust him, trust his reasons, and trust his timing. Well, what do you do? What do you do when God closes the door? What do you do when it seems like the door just gets slammed shut in your face? Maybe you're looking for a job, and it seems like you just go to an interview, and it seems like maybe this could be the one, and then you don't get it. You go to another interview, and you don't get that one, and the door just continues to get slammed shut. Or maybe you're looking for a husband or a wife, and you go out on a date or two, and you think maybe this is the one, and then that door gets slammed shut. It's not the one. Maybe you're trying to start a family, have a baby, and... It just seems like whatever you do, just that, that door just gets slammed shut. And you can't get pregnant. I don't want to trivialize this at all, but as a church, this has been a lot of where we've been for the past four years. When it comes to pursuing facilities, our expanded space, we started off four years ago by, by pursuing this bread store right next to us, and that door was slammed shut. So then we pursued the building that's now Legends, And that door was slammed shut. So then we pursued the building that used to be home lumber, and that door was slammed shut. And then we pursued the long-term care wing of the Sanford Hospital, and that door was slammed shut. And it seemed like everywhere we go, like God would be leading in a direction, and then the door would just get slammed shut. What do you do when God closes the door? Well, then interestingly enough, after all of these pursuits, God left us, led us full circle over here to the bread store, which just all of a sudden became available. Without any of our trying, without any of our, our pursuing, God just then opened the door. Paul and Silas wanted to serve God. They had good intentions. 
They had a good purpose and a good plan. They just wanted to share Christ with people. There was nothing wrong with it except that God had a better way. It wasn't God's plan for the moment. It wasn't God's timing. And later on, we're going to discover in just a little bit what God's plan was and how it was even bigger and better than anything that Paul could have dreamed up. Number three, a church on call will leave whenever God says. Leave whenever God says. Verse 10, so we decided to leave for Macedonia at once. We decided to leave at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. How many parents do we have in the room here? I'm a parent. Parents, when you tell your kids to come or to go or to do something or not do something, when do you want them to do it? Now, right? Not five minutes from now. Not 10 minutes from now, not tomorrow, not next week. You want them to do it now, immediately, at once. You don't want them to argue with you. You don't want them to give you a list of reasons of why they shouldn't do it now or to ask you a bunch of questions. You just want their immediate obedience. It's not just a question of power and authority. Well, maybe a little bit. But it's not just about power and authority. It's about safety an opportunity. If your children do not immediately obey, they could be harmed. Most likely by me, if they're not going to listen, but, but they could be harmed. Or they could miss an opportunity that you have for them. When it comes to being God's child, the expectation is the same. He wants our immediate obedience. Listen to what happened when Jesus called people to follow him in Matthew chapter 4. We begin in verse 18. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Then verse 19. Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets when? At once, and they followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called to them, come, he's called, come, he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Five years ago, God gave me and our leaders a a vision, a vision for for having another Epiphany Station out of a satellite site of Epiphany Station in East Grand Forks. And I was thinking about this this week, and I was like, has it really been five years? And I looked back over, and it, it was June 24th, 2009, when I first stood up here, and I shared that vision with people. It's been over five years. And in our minds as leaders, there was no doubt that this is something that God was calling us to do. And because there was no doubt that God was calling us to do this, we did a bunch of research. We've read books on the topic of how to start another, another site somewhere else. We've gone and we visited churches that are in small towns that are doing similar things. We've gone to conferences and seminars to, to learn from the best and the experts We've done all the research, but five years later, here we sit with no greater plan than we had when God first gave us the vision five years ago. And I fear that we may have missed an opportunity that God has for us. Maybe not, but maybe so. And I was talking about this yesterday with Maddie, and Maddie's like, you're not going to actually say that, are you? It sounds so depressing. We want to inspire people. But I want us to feel the weight of that for a moment. God calls us to go at once. And when we don't respond to that calling, we can miss the opportunity that God has for us. And hopefully we haven't, but it could be. Maybe you've been reluctant to do something that God's been calling you to do. 
asking you to do. Sure, you have good reasons. Like we have good reasons why we haven't been pursuing another site. You know, we don't have the money. We don't have the right people. We have to get our facilities in, in order here. Maybe you have good reasons. You need to get your finances in order. You need to get your family in order. You have a good job, but whatever it might be. But your, your reluctance to follow God where he leads you and to go when he says may have caused you to miss the opportunity that God has for you. There's a time, now understand, I know there's a time for planning and preparation. God doesn't want us to be foolish, but there is a time where God demands our immediate obedience. And sometimes I think, just anecdotally, I think that, that God causes visionaries like myself to have to sit and wait, where he calls planners and analyzers to go at once, just to mess with us, just to, just to keep us on our toes a little bit, maybe grow our character a little bit. Go at once. Number four, a church on call will share with whomever God shows. Share with whomever God shows. Verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. We sat down to speak with some women who gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart, and she accepted what Paul was saying. So she was baptized along with other members of her household, and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. Now, curiously, Paul had a vision of a man calling him over to Macedonia, but he ends up sharing with a group of women. I don't think this is quite what Paul had in mind. Now, first of all, there was no synagogue in Philippi, which was Paul's custom. He would go to the synagogue. But because there was no synagogue, that he went to the river and expecting to find men, he found a group of women. Now, you might not think this is a big deal, but it's a pretty big deal, actually, because Women in Jewish culture at that time, in the Mideast at that time, were so lowly regarded that Jewish rabbis actually said this, and I quote, don't kill the messenger, I'm just quoting, they said, it is better that the words of the law be burned than be delivered to a woman. That's what they believed. So to go and share with a group of women sitting by the river was a huge cultural, and even in this case, a theological no-no. Yet even though it didn't meet Paul's expectations, even though it maybe didn't quite fit within his theological framework, he shares the good news with whomever God puts in his path. Remember where God prevented Paul from going? To Asia, which is right here. Where's Lydia from? Thyatira, right there in the heart of Asia. You know Paul had to just shake his head and go, oh God, you stinker. You got me. I had no idea what you were doing when you closed that door. But now I see this is only something that you could possibly do. Lead me to somebody in a different region where the good news hasn't even been and have me share with somebody who's from that region that will go back there and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Who has God put in front of you? Maybe it's a a neighbor that you can't stand, or a coworker that you don't respect. Maybe it's a family member that drives you crazy. And because they're not like you, and maybe you don't like them, they don't meet your expectations. You're completely looking past them. But this is the person that God has placed in your life because they need to see and hear the good news of Jesus Christ and guess who God wants to, sh them, to share it with them. And maybe, just maybe, God has put somebody different than you in your life because you need to grow in an area. And they're going to help sharpen your character. Don't let the unexpected keep you 
from what God expects of you. Here's the last thing. Number five, a church on call will connect however God works. Connect however God works. That's a little cumbersome wordy, word-wise, so let me explain. Verse 13, on the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer, and we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. Now understand, it was Paul's habit in every city that he went to that he would go first to the synagogue and he would go there on the Sabbath and he would preach the good news to the Jews that were gathered in the synagogue. That's the way he had always done it. Okay? You get that? That's the way he had always done it. Here's the problem. There's no synagogue in Philippi. Now what is he going to do? Imagine, imagine if Paul was so entrenched in his methodology, so entrenched in his ways that he showed up at Philippi and he went, well, there's no synagogue here. I guess God wants us to go somewhere else. We better go to another city and find a synagogue so we can share the good news. But thankfully, he doesn't do that at all. He goes there and he sees God is at work here and I'm going to connect with the people here however God is working, using whatever method possible to reach them. Craig Groeschel, who's pastor of LifeChurch.tv, who's behind, LifeChurch is behind the YouVersion Bible app that many of you have on your phones and on your devices He's one of my favorite authors and speakers and because he says some really great things. And one of my favorite quotes from, them, from him is this. He says, in order to reach people that nobody's reaching, you have to do things that no one else is doing. In order to reach people that no one else is reaching, you have to do things that no one else is doing. The way that we've always done things will not work to reach people who we are not currently reaching. If you're not reaching people, then you can't keep doing the things that you've always been doing because in order to reach people that nobody's reaching, you have to do things that nobody else is doing. And that is the impetus behind Epiphany Station and the way that we do things. But even we can get so entrenched in our ways and our methodology that we miss the next generation. And we have to keep on changing and not get so enamored with our methods and our ways of doing things that we miss the opportunity to share the message of Jesus Christ with people that don't know him. It's not enough to simply know who God wants us to reach. We have to understand how God wants us to reach them. Well, there may not have been this synagogue in Philippi, But because Paul was willing to do whatever it takes, because he was willing to go wherever God leads, because he was willing to leave whenever God said, to share with whomever God shows and connect however God works, even though there was not a synagogue, there would soon be a church in Philippi. And the good news of Jesus Christ would be firmly entrenched in Europe and spread from there. And later on, Paul would write a letter to the church in Philippi that started on this day in Acts chapter 16. And it's in the book of Philippians in the New Testament of the Bible, if you would like to read it. It's a great little book. And the good news of Jesus Christ continued to spread and expand and grow from there and become an unstoppable worldwide force. Now, in the bottom of your program there, in your outline, there are just three next steps for you to take, for us to take really as a church They're sort of simple yet very complex because they require a lot of prayer and discernment. The first first step is this, is to see who are we not reaching? Who are we not reaching as a church? Where do you sense that God might be leading you, might be leading us as a church that so far we haven't gone? Number two, ask. Ask God, how can we reach those people? 
How can we reach the people that nobody else is reaching? Are we, are you so married to our methods, so married to our preferences, so married to our our politics or whatever it might be, that we miss the opportunity to reach the people that are right in front of our faces? And then third, do. Do listen to God and do what he says at once. You want just a fun social experiment? If you are a planner and an analyzer, just try it once. If you feel that God is calling you to do something, just do it and see what happens. I bet God will knock your socks off. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your unstoppable church that you have called us to be a part of. And God, as we talk about these things today, we ask that they would not just be words that are mere theory. God, but that they would be words that are firmly entrenched in our hearts and go from our hearts to our hands and our feet. God, that you would help us discern as your church here in Thief River Falls who it is that that you're calling us to reach and how to reach them and how we may continue to expand your kingdom reign here in Thief River Falls and beyond to the, the other regions around. God, as for your glory that we pray. Amen.